Good morning, Elk Point Baptist Church family. This marks our third week meeting in this manner, and I want to encourage you that I have been greatly moved by the the way that our community has responded in the in the face of these unique times, the interaction and the community and the care that I've seen displayed by the members of our church for one another has been very heartwarming to see. And I just want to encourage you to please continue caring for one another as best you can, but as, as we all know, keep doing it from a, from a safe distance. And I would also like to wish you all a happy Palm Sunday. Today we are marking one of the most important dates on the Christian calendar. It's the beginning of Passion Week that culminates in um, recounting Christ's death and resurrection on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. But Palm Sunday is the day where we recount Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem near the end of his ministry here on earth. This Easter season is going to look different than any other in modern history. There won't be any large gatherings. Churches will be continue to be closed and the family that would normally be coming around for Easter dinner likely won't be around. So I encourage you even in the midst of these things, like I said before, care for one another in the midst of these trying times. Still attempt to connect as best you can. But this Easter season being different, it is no less cause for celebration. Indeed, our current COVID-19 pandemic serves to highlight the fact that something in our world is truly broken. And it elevates in our mind the need for the hope found in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Our world is not as it should be. Our hearts are not as they should be. But by the work of Christ through the Holy Spirit, we have been given a hope and a future that lasts beyond the bounds of this world, that exists beyond the bounds of our homebound life, but our hope extends throughout eternity. So as far as Palm Sunday goes, I'm getting quite familiar with the, with the Palm Sunday service because I realized as I started to put together a message for today that this is the fourth Palm Sunday in the last five Palm Sundays that I have been on deck to preach. I'll blame it on Easter being a particularly busy time for pastors and they're all preparing for uh, Easter services, Monday, Thursday services, Good Friday services, that kind of thing. So it becomes a convenient time for a senior pastor to relinquish his pulpit. But I even talked with Jim about this and he said it's by no intentional means that I've ended up preaching fairly regularly on Palm Sunday, but I at the same time have enjoyed getting to become familiar with, with this observance. Normally it's been a great Sunday to do a separate topical message focusing on Matthew's account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem at the end of his ministry. And that happens in chapter 21 of the book of Matthew. And it ties in with the prophecy in Zechariah 9 where Zechariah tells the people that this is what's going to be happening. Again, I marvel at God's sovereignty in putting together our services and planning the way that each one of these things would work out. God has been working in my heart a desire to preach through the book of Hebrews. And today, as God, God has given me a perfect segue into that book. Zechariah 9, Zechariah is prophesying of Christ's triumphal entry, and it goes like this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It's an Old Testament prophet speaking to the 
fathers of Israel predicting the coming of Christ, the King, the Messiah. And glory to God, would you listen to the words of our passage today? Our passage today is Hebrews chapter one, verses one through three, and I cannot stress enough the fact that God has organized this in a very exciting way. Again, Hebrews chapter one, verses one through three. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. If anyone wants to argue with me that God doesn't sovereignly ordain what he wants to say to his people through his word, I will happily take them up on that challenge. I just happened to preach this Sunday, which I just happened to have finished my series on James, and this just happens to be Palm Sunday, which happens to center on an Old Testament prophet prophesying of the coming of Christ. And I just happen to be preaching on Hebrews chapter one, verses one to three, which happens to be about the coming of Christ and his supremacy, particularly over the Old Testament prophets. That is about five just happens too many for me. God puts these things together for his glory and for the good of his church. And thank God that our church has adopted this philosophy of expositional preaching where we work through books of the Bible at a time, taking whole chunks of scripture and it would be easy for this to start to seem rote and very organized. Okay, obviously next I'm going into Hebrews chapter one verses four and onwards and just progressing through the books and feeling like we are not, um, not following a, a leading of God in doing so but God has very faithfully connected each week's sermon, regardless of if we are just following straight through from one passage to the next, still each sermon somehow ends up being particularly relevant to the the effects of the day. And I am so thankful that for the glory of God and for the good of his church that we have had the opportunity to sit under such great expositional preaching from Pastor Jim and the opportunity I've had to, to learn of this from him. So would you join with me in prayer as we thank God for his work among our church and for our service this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer and we thank you for your glory and your goodness. Lord, you are sovereign and you have ordained that your church would be taught by the preaching of your word. And Lord, we pray that as your word is preached week in and week out from this church that you would continue to provide opportunities for us to see your word put into action in our hearts and our lives. That you would apply it to the various situations of our daily life and we would not go forth unchanged, but that your word would be in action in our lives. We know that your word does not return void, but it is sharper than any two-edged sword, and that it would be penetrating into our hearts and our souls and our minds and making a difference in the way that we live. Lord, in all things, that it might turn our hearts and thoughts towards you, that we might glorify you. And Lord, we pray that it would be words of life to those who needs to hear it. Lord, we thank you for these things and for our opportunity to meet together even in these virtual means. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As God has been working in my heart, guiding me towards the book of Hebrews, I had no end of hesitation in moving into this book. Here's a book that 
requires both Old Testament and New Testament grounding. It has disputed authorship, disputed audience, disputed date of writing, disputed place of origin. Some have even disputed its position within the canon of scripture. This is not an easy book to spend time in. And I came up with all manner of excuses as I felt like this was where God was leading me. I came up with all sorts of excuses. Well, I'm, I'm young, I haven't been preaching for that long, maybe I should, should wait until I have more experience or, well, I just finished preaching James and Hebrew is like the book before James so maybe I should just hold off and put some space in between Hebrews and James so I'm not just working my way backwards through the New Testament. But regardless of the excuses I came up with, I still was drawn back to it and it still became clear to me that this is where God was leading me to preach. And thankfully this book leaves me right where I believe any pastor should be as he approaches scripture, humbled and excited. I'm humbled by the task at hand of preaching through a book of such magnitude. And I'm also so excited about where it's going to take us and even just the work that God's been doing in my heart from the time I've spent studying. And a good chunk of our, our message this morning will be doing some background work on the book of Hebrews as a whole and then we'll dive into our, into our passage. So to get to the start of this book, we have to hop to the conclusion where the author of Hebrews identifies the book as a whole as a word of exhortation. It's a written sermon or homily that is designed to exhort, which is to encourage or admonish its readers. The author of Hebrews looks to drive home the supremacy of Christ overall over all beings, all systems, all beliefs, over anything and everything in the universe, the author wants us to understand that Christ is supreme. He would have us know that Christ is sufficient and that faith in him and him only is necessary for salvation. The authorship of Hebrews, as I stated before, has been disputed and it has become a sticking point for many. Some have said it was most certainly Paul. Others say it was Apollos or Luke or Barnabas. And some say that it was a tag team between Priscilla and Aquila. And the list goes on and on. But most commentators I've found, while they lean one way or another, and I have my own personal leanings, and I would happily discuss what, what my thoughts were, but almost all of them quote the early church father origin in their conclusion. Most of them will say from origin, who wrote the epistle? God only knows the truth. We can have our guesses but we cannot say for certain who the author of Hebrews is and that uncertainty is part of what led some to question the book's position within the canon of scripture. In early Christianity, the canonicity of a New Testament book relied heavily on its apostolic origins. Either it had to be written by an apostle or by someone who was connected to the apostles. And lacking proof of such authorship caused some to question the position of Hebrews within scripture. And I have to beg to a quote from John Calvin on this matter and I absolutely love this. He said, I do not doubt that it has been through the craft of Satan that any have been led to dispute its authority. There is indeed no book in Holy Scripture which speaks so clearly of the priesthood of Christ, which so highly exalts the virtue and dignity of that only true sacrifice which he offered by his death, which so abundantly deals with the use of ceremonies as well as their abrogation, and in a word so fully explains that Christ is the end of the law. Let us therefore not allow the church of God or ourselves to be deprived of so great a benefit, but firmly defend the possession of it. The last piece of background I want to offer 
was who was the audience of the book of Hebrews. One might assume that that neatly falls within the name of the book, and on a grand scale, you'd probably be correct. But I want you to remember that as you're reading through your Bibles, the titles given to biblical books, as well as um, chapter numbers, first numbers, headings of sections and other divisions, for the most part, shouldn't be considered as inspired scripture. Oftentimes, they were added afterwards to give some organization to our, our modern Bibles. There are certain uh, books that are titled and titled by the original authors, but Hebrews was not one of them. And Hebrews doesn't even do what most New Testament epistles does where it names who it was written to. Many of our New Testament books are named according to who they're written to, the letter to the Corinthians or to the Ephesians or the Philippians. These are letters written to a particular audience, but Hebrews was not given such, such a easy title. But we aren't left just to guess at who, who the audience might be. There's several phrases and clues throughout the book give us the intended audience and even the rough time period. First of all, the book of Hebrews is steeped in Jewish tradition. It requires the person to be familiar with the Old Testament text as well as the Jewish sacrificial system. That points us towards an audience that was Jewish in origin. And chapter three, verse one, narrows things down from the Jewish people as a whole to Jewish believers in particular. Calling the audience of the book, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling. That couldn't apply to non-believing Jewish people, to just the Jewish nation, but it's narrowed down to Jewish Christians in particular. Then chapter two, verse three says, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. This gives us an audience of Jewish believers who are removed from the direct ministry of Christ. The ministry of Christ is to a group of people, and then these believers heard secondhand from those people what Christ had been doing and the work that he had done and had come to faith by this testimony. And finally, the present tense is used in passages regarding the Jewish temple worship. <coughs> Hebrews chapter nine, verse six says, speaking of the Jewish temple worship, these preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties. And it goes on. And this tells us that at this point, the Jewish temple worship was still occurring, which we know in AD 70, the Jewish temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. So this puts us pre-AD 70. All of these combined to place the letter of the Hebrews in the hands of mid to late first century Jewish believers who had received and believed the message of the gospel, not from Christ himself, but from a secondary source. And while this might seem like just details that we maybe don't need, as we study the word, the audience of the original author is very important for us to remember. These words were written by their author for a particular purpose in a particular group and have an intended effect in mind for the author's audience. We can't simply take carte blanche and insert ourselves into the story as one of the characters or the intended audience. I'll take a quote from Matt Chandler who says, you're not David in one of his message. He's referring here to the modern tendency to put ourselves in the place of David in the David versus Goliath saga in 1 Samuel. That passage wasn't written with a switchable protagonist. We can't just insert ourselves in there and claim for ourselves any promises made to David. And 
Our passage today don't, doesn't have a switchable audience. We can't simply substitute 21st century Gentiles in for first century Jewish people and be able to just run with it and assume that that will all make sense. We have to dig deeper in our study of a passage and try to understand what it meant to the original audience so that we can properly understand what it means for us today. The late Dr. R.C. Sproul is quoted as saying, if I were ever to, cast, ever to be cast into prison and had the option of having only one book with me, that the book I would choose, of course, would be the Bible. And if I had to narrow my choice further to choose one book of the Bible, the book that I would want with me in prison would be the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is so rich, it has such a wealth of information that covers the whole scope of the history of redemption. It is almost a capsule summary of the Old Testament, as well as the focus on the way in which Christ fulfills all of that Old Testament redemptive history. Beginning to end, this book of Hebrews shouts out of the redemption work of God. This is accomplished in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And our passage this morning identifies this flow from the Old Testament of the law and the prophets to the New Testament words of the Son of God from the old covenant of temple worship and sacrifices to the new covenant of Christ's righteousness imputed to us by grace through faith. Let's read again our passage this morning. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by his word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I want to spend the rest of our time together breaking down this passage. And first and foremost, we need to recognize that God speaks. He has not left humanity the pinnacle of his creation here on earth. He has not left us adrift without direction. Over the course of history, God has always generally revealed himself in nature. Romans 1.20 says, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. That general revelation, while it has pointed us in a direction, it has never been enough. It makes mankind say, there must be a God. But it has never been enough to teach us who that God might be. For that, we needed God's special revelation of himself to make himself known to us, and he does that today in Scripture. Upon humanity's fall in the Garden of Eden, they were no longer able to commune and walk with their God as they had in the beginning. Our, our connection with God was broken. And thus he began communicating via his chosen prophets. As our passage states, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. These prophets were granted the opportunity to hear from God. They had heard from the Lord of hosts and spoke to the people that God says this, God wants us to this, and that was how God communicated and it was honestly a limited form of communication. People didn't have free access before God, but God had always promised to restore his relationship and his communion with his people. He promised a Messiah that would come and fix the damage that had been done, the separation that had been caused by sin. And now, in Christ, all of God's promises find their fulfillment. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. We live in this almost and not yet world where God has already accomplished a, a work that 
his promises have been fulfilled in Christ. This already and not yet thing where Christ has come, Christ has fulfilled these promises, but we have yet to see the fullness of that fulfillment. But God's revelation progressed from the general revelation in creation to the special re- revelation from there must be a lowercase g God somewhere to the I am God of Israel in the Old Testament. But he was still veiled for the safety of his people, still hidden in pillars of cloud and fire, still hidden behind the veil in the holy of holies of the tabernacle. But now it has progressed to Emmanuel, God with us in Christ. This God has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, but his revelation of himself has changed. He revealed himself in nature, then he revealed himself through the prophets, and now he has revealed himself in his son, Jesus Christ. Our understanding of him and our ability to know and commune with him is what has been progressively restored by the Lord. And it will be ultimately restored when each one of us get to meet him face to face. Our current relationship with God is no longer on the basis of shed blood of animals and temple worship. No, our relationship with the Father is by the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The book of Hebrews is a book about the God-man, the second member of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Appropriately, it opens by giving us a brief but absolutely packed summary of Jesus' credentials. In these last days he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. God made himself known via his fingerprints on the world through his chosen prophets, and now and finally in his son. And the author of Hebrews gives seven credentials of Christ. These credentials serve as an unassailable list of qualities which trump the claim of any other being. No man, no prophet, no king, no heavenly being can claim superiority to Christ. No other being in the universe can claim these things as Christ can. First, Christ has been appointed the heir of all things. It echoes from Psalm 2 where God the Father says, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. The Jesus revealed to us in scripture is the just and rightful heir to all of creation. All of the universe and all things are under his lordship. Christ is also the one through whom the world was created. So as Christ is the rightful ruler of all things, he is also the genesis of all things. John 1, 1 to 3 is a beautiful passage of scripture and one I would encourage all of you to memorize and have on hand. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the word being Christ. We are told throughout scripture that Christ is the Father's agent in creation. And if you skip down a little bit in our passage this morning from the first promises here, we are also told that not only is he the ruler and creative agent, he is also the sustaining power 
behind our world. Colossians 1.17 says that Christ is before all things and in him all things hold together. In truth, everything about our existence, our rightful ruler, our creation, and our sustenance, all are found in Christ. And these promises are profoundly important. These criteria and um, characteristics of Christ cannot be understated. But the first two points that you can find in Hebrews chapter one, verse three, we absolutely cannot afford to miss. Christ is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. I have to thank Pastor Jim for his tireless work in our Sunday school to go through many of the historic and modern heresies that have assailed the church. For those of you that have joined in on those sessions, you'll know that the denial of Christ's divinity, the rejection of his deity was and is a central concern of Christian orthodoxy. There are so many groups that would deny that Jesus is God. Christ isn't like God. Christ isn't God light. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. We know even from Christ's own claims in John 1, 7, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Christ is God. Let no one lead you astray on that. I'm quoting theologian F.F. F. Bruce, what God essentially is is made manifest in Christ. To see Christ is to see what the Father is like. And the final piece of the puzzle here, after making purification for sins, he, Christ, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Christ could be our rightful ruler. He could be our creation and our sustenance. He could be the radiance and the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. But none of this is good news to us as sinners until this final piece comes in. To the unrighteous, to those that deny God and in doing so condemn themselves, the fact that Christ is all of those things is what has undone them. Their denial of him is what has damned them. Christ says in Matthew 10, 33, that whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. But honestly, all of us have denied Christ, either explicitly or implicitly. By our words or our deeds, we have refused his claim of lordship over our lives. We have refused to acknowledge his supremacy over all things. But praise be to God that Christ has made purification for the sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. No one else could do this. No one else lived the perfect sinless life that Christ did. No one else was the perfect sacrifice, fully God and yet fully man, fully experiencing what it is like and the temptations and the struggles of being human while yet remaining perfect in his obedience to his Father. Christ is our perfect priest and Christ is the spotless lamb that was slain. Behold, he is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This Christ is the one who rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the one of whom the crowd shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The Jesus described in our passage was foretold by Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
That same Jesus would surpass Zechariah and all of the other Old Testament prophets as God's revelation of himself. This Jesus is the one in whom we trust. Brothers and sisters, we need to be reminded of the supremacy of Christ, particularly in the days in which we are currently living. There's no person, no power, no circumstance, no government agency, and no disease or pandemic that surpasses him. And everything in our universe is subject to his rule and his reign, the rule of the heir of all things. Learn to rest and rely on this, my family, and you will find no bottom to the well of benefits for your soul. Rest and rely on the fact that Christ is supreme. Christ is the ruler and heir of our world and nothing can surpass him and nothing is beyond his control. And family, let nothing and no one usurp Christ's rightful place as Lord of your hearts. And if you have not recognized this as the truth and Honestly, that is what you are doing because Christ is Lord whether you've believed that or not. I encourage you, if you haven't recognized this as the truth, then cast aside your pride, let go of your hold on your old life, your own lordship over your own desires, and acknowledge Christ as your Lord and Savior and your King before it is too late. Truly, Christ was Lord before anything else existed. Christ is Lord now, regardless of what anyone says, and Christ will be Lord when he returns to gather his people to himself. And if we refuse and fail to submit to his lordship, then we place ourselves at odds and in rebellion to the Lord God Almighty of the universe. This is not something that will be overlooked at the end of all things, but it will become our undoing. There is no salvation outside of Christ making purification for our sins, and that is only for those who have confessed with their mouths that Jesus is Lord and believed in their hearts that God has raised him from the dead. I pray, brothers and sisters, that the supremacy of Christ would be a source of hope and not a source of dread for you that you may earnestly desire his lordship rather than kick against it. Because at the end of all things, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. There's no option on this. Every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess regardless of whether or not we are willing or want to. Our decision is, will we confess while there is still time? Will we bow the knee and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord while our sins may yet be while our sins may yet be brought before the throne of grace and dealt with by the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross? I cannot help but thank the Lord for the fact that Christ went to the cross and made purification for my sin. I am a broken and sinful human being, but I have a great and glorious sinless Savior who is the heir of all things and the creator and sustainer of the universe. As we close this morning, I intend to end each one of these sermons from Hebrews on the same benediction that the author left his audience with. I remember growing up that one of my senior pastors as a child ended every sermon with the exact same benediction, week after week, month after month, and 
There were times where it became a little bit of a joke and we'd kind of recite it along with him as he did it and he did it in the exact same tone, exact same meter and we were able to do it word for word. But this benediction is one that I hope by the time I am done working my way through this book that it might be written on your hearts and might be an encouragement to you every day. So as we close this morning, I'll read the benediction and then we will have a closing song and I encourage you to um, find the discussion questions off of the website and partake in those together in your family groups and that you might be blessed by continuing to dig into this word that God's given us. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining with us this morning, and I pray that God would go with you this week and that you would find ways to be a blessing to one another, to your neighbors, and that in all things, Christ would be supreme in your life.